Good afternoon, everyone. I'm William Madro, Head of Special Collections in the University Archives, and I would like to welcome everyone as we celebrate Women's History Month with today's presentation, Miami Presents the History and Legacy of Western College. First, I would like to recognize our sponsors, the Western College Alumni Association, Miami University Libraries, and the Mi and Miami University Alumni Association. On behalf of Miami University Libraries and Dean Jerome Conley, I want to thank them for their support. I also want to thank those staff who helped organize this presentation today, notably J.J. Slager, Gabe Haverkos, and especially Jackie Johnson for planning this event. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Debbie Baker is the director of the Western College Alumni Association. She provides support for the, the Western College Alumni Association Board of Trustees and is responsible for the daily operation and the, of the organization including fundraising, budget management, event planning, and various publications. Debbie has been with been at Miami working with the, the Alumni Association since 1999 and received her BIS from Miami University with concentrations in organizational leadership, gerontology, and families, gender, and society. Eric Harrelson is the preservation and conservation librarian at Miami University. He is responsible for the care, maintenance, and storage of Miami University Library's general collections and the materials found in Special Collections University Archives. He has been with Miami since 2023. He received his BA from Ohio State, the Ohio State University, and his MLIS from the University of North Texas. He is also co-author with Joseph Laycock of the newly published book, The Exorcist Effect, Horror Religion and Demonic Belief, uh, put out by Oxford University Press. Uh, we want to thank those who submitted questions ahead of time. There will be opportunity for more questions during the presentation, and the presenters will answer the questions after the presentation. So I now turn it over to our distinguished presenters. Thank you, Bill. So on this first slide, I wanted to share some additional resources for you if you want to take a quick snapshot. Um, we're cramming a lot of history into a very short time. So if you're interested in learning more, these are some of the resources. The Sarah Isabel Howe manuscript, um, she was an 1865 Western Female Seminary graduate graduate, and the manuscript was never actually published, but we have provided bound copies to both the Smith Regional History Library and the um, Western College Memorial Archives. Dr. Narkin Nelson's book, she was a 1920 graduate of Western. Uh, she served on the Western faculty and also as a foreign student advisor. Uh, this book is available on Amazon, eBay, used bookstores, and if you obtain a copy of it, there are two full pages of other reference materials regarding Western. And then Phyllis Hoyt's memoir is available through our office, the Western College Alumni Association, and she documents her time at Western between 1946 and 1974. And the Western College for Women by Jacqueline Johnson, University Archivist, is an Arcadia pictorial history, which is available on Amazon and also through our office. Um, I also encourage you to visit the Western College Memorial Archives, either in person or online. You can literally spend hours looking at Western materials. It's and it's super interesting and fun. Um, in addition to that, Dr. Kurt Ellison created a lecture series about Western many years ago. And I think that we all should encourage him now that we have resources such as these webinars, um, we should encourage him to resurrect that series so that we can all enjoy it again. And then lastly, the photo to the right in this slide is simply of one of my favorite photos from Western. So now moving on to the history. The Western Female Seminary was founded in 1853 by the Reverend Daniel Tenney of the Second Presbyterian Church of Oxford and with his wife, Mary Adams Parker Tenney, also with the support of the community. Reverend Tenney contemplated establishing a school for girls for several years. Upon receiving a letter from Lyman Beach, Beecher encouraging him to move forward, he began seeking donations and pledges to fund the seminary. 
He was a skillful fundraiser. In a matter of weeks, he had collected the $25,000 needed to move forward. The residential institution was modeled after Mount Holyoke Seminary, which kept tuition low by requiring students to perform some of the domestic tasks. Helen Peabody was hired as the seminary's first principal. She and the seminary's first instructors were all graduates of Mount Holyoke. The first building, Seminary Hall, was later renamed Peabody Hall. The first students were enrolled in 1855. The curriculum was rigorous. For example, students were required to take three years of Latin. The campus positioned on the east side of Oxford was named Western because its location was west of Mount Holyoke. And I just want to point out in the photos of this slide two things. First of all, the plaque for the Tenney Gateway, that gateway still exists today. It's the southern entrance to Western College Drive. Um, it's it, directly in front of the art museum. And then secondly, the photograph from 1880, this was the seminary's 25th anniversary. And this occasion documents Western's commitment to improving human values and making a difference in the world. At this time, 39 Western graduates were serving as missionaries in nine different countries and in the Dakota Territory. In 1894, under the leadership of Leela McKee, the seminary became the Western, a college and seminary for women. President McKee was one of the youngest college presidents in the country and the first woman to join the Association of Ohio College Presidents. The college awarded its first Bachelor of Arts degrees in 1895. One of the college's first graduates was the daughter of a Western and Miami merger, Annette Covington. Ms. Covington became an accomplished artist and a collection of her work was donated to the Miami University Art Museum and then exhibited in 1982. In 1902, Western admitted its first truly international student from Tokyo, Japan. New Hall was constructed on three acres of ground donated by James Patterson and later renamed McKee Hall. Just to point out in the photograph, the upper right, it's the class of 1877, uh, Leela McKee, that was her class, and she's the student pictured in the far right holding the book. And then just below that is Annette Covington's diploma, which has been on display in Patterson Place for the last 50 years and will be moving soon to the Western College Memorial Archives. And then in the center, Long before Frisbee golf, Western laid out a nine hole golf course in 1895. In 1903, seminary was dropped from the school's title. Dr. Lillian Wyckoff Johnson, a Wellesley grad, served as Western's president from 1904 to 1906. Dr. Johnson was the first woman to earn a doctoral degree from Cornell. In 1908, the Ohio legislature ratified the change of the college's name to the Western College for Women. Dr. John Grant Newman served as Western's first male president from 1908 to 1912. This was a time of financial growth for Western's endowment fund and a period of reorganization of the academic standards. In 1910, Jesse Gregg Stillman Kelly was hired by the college to become the director of piano instruction. At Western, her husband, Edgar Stillman Kelly, a well-recognized composer of music, became the first artist in residence at a college in the United States. Sawyer Gymnasium was constructed in 1912. It was a state-of-the-art facility, including an indoor swimming pool. For a lengthy period of time, Western students had to pass a swimming test in order to graduate. In 
1914, Dr. William Waddell Boyd was appointed as Western's fourth president. During Dr. Boyd's tenure, Western entered into a period of material and academic prosperity. The freshman class was the largest of the history of the college and the college became free of debt. During World War I, the students planted war gardens on some of the college's 420 acres. From 1914 to 1931, Cephas Burns, an African-American stonemason, replaced the wooden bridges with stone bridges built from cannonball stones collected from local creek beds. Kumler Chapel was constructed with a design based on a church in Normandy, France in 1918 and named for the Kumler family, which included Western graduates, trustees, and Western benefactors. Mary Lyon Hall, the Lodge, and Presser Hall were completed under Dr. Boyd's presidency. Ernst Nature Theater opened in 1924. The theater was named for the donor, Richard P. Ernst, a former U.S. Senator and Western trustee. Ernst Nature Theater was designed by the well-known Olmsted Brothers architectural firm, which also designed Manhattan Central Park and many other beautiful parks in our country. Um, Ernst Nature Theater was originally built, um, the photograph in the center of this slide shows what it looked like when it was originally built. And thanks to the generosity of a Western donor in the 1990s, the theater was completely renovated. So it looks very different today. And then in the photo in the far lower far right, that's inside the Western Lodge. I found it a little interesting that this photo contains six men and only two women. But according to several Western husbands that I've encountered over the years, the coffee served at the lodge was much better there than elsewhere in the community. From 1931 to 1941, Ralph Hickok served as Western's president. The Great Depression led to decreased enrollment and financial difficulties for Western. Faculty salaries were cut by 10%. The weekly school newspaper, the Western Roundup was published and a new degree in music was offered. Three presidents served short tenures over the next 12 years. Mary Moore Dabney Thompson, Philip Eldon Henderson, and Dr. Edmund Case Jr. Two new buildings were constructed, Clawson and Boyd Halls. A department of theater was established and puppetry was offered through the English department. In 1945, the college opened a radio studio and became the first woman's college to broadcast every weekday over a commercial radio station, which was Hamilton's WMOH. Once again, during World War II, students raised food crops, this time calling them victory gardens. And I just wanted to point out in the photo in the center, you can see some of the Western puppeteers and the puppets in the background. The student to the far left is Catherine Piper. She was class of 1958 and she became a professional puppeteer. That was her career. And she created some beautiful puppets and shared her talents with us during a couple of the alumni weekends here on campus. In the 1950s, under the leadership of President Herrick Black Young, Western became an international college with an intercultural focus. A visiting lectureship and international faculty were added. International students were recruited, recruited to increase the global diversity on campus. Each summer, a student travel seminar, or what we call study abroad today, visited the global region which had been studied throughout that year. The first year of the international plan, 20 students from 16 countries attended Western. 10 years later, international students comprised approximately 10% of the student body. The new international program put Western on the map. 
In a New York Times Education and Review article, Western is cited as the first college in this country to reorient its own program to meet the requirements of a student body drawn from many lands. The only building constructed during this period was a dormitory, which was later renamed Thompson Hall. In the summer of 1964, the campus was leased for the orientation of volunteer civil rights activists, whose mission was to prepare Blacks in Mississippi for voter registration. Approximately 800 to 1,000 volunteers, depending on what resource you're looking at, um, from across the United States converged on the Western campus. Known as the Freedom Summer Project, this was considered one of the turning points in the civil rights movement that summer. Although controversial and devastating at the time with the murders of two trainers, Michael Schwerner and John Cheney, and volunteer Andrew Goodman, today we proudly celebrate the courage and conviction of Western's administrators for allowing the trainings to be held on the campus. And although no Western students or faculty were including in those trainings that summer, a group of students raised funds and participated in the March on Montgomery in March of 1965. The Freedom Summer Memorial constructed by Miami University with financial support from the Oxford NAACP is an outdoor learning center which commemorates the civil rights trainings held on the Western campus in 1964. William C. Spencer served as Western's last president from 1969 to 1974. Faced with declining enrollment and resources, President Spencer assigned a committee of administrators, alumni, emeriti, faculty, and students to focus on Western's future. A new curriculum called Freedom with Responsibility was developed. Students designed individualized programs with faculty consultation. Letter grades were dropped. In 1972, men were admitted. They were innovative steps, but unfortunately they were too little too late. Rumors of Western's financial issues led to the formation of the Save Western Student Campaign in October of 1973. The student's first step was collecting $380 to purchase New York lottery tickets. Unfortunately, the effort only yielded a small amount of winnings, but did attract national media attention. Faced with bankruptcy, Western administrators and the Board of Trustees entered into negotiations with Miami University. When Miami acquired the campus and facilities in exchange for paying off Western's debt, approximately a dozen staff members, including administrators, instructors, and maintenance workers were hired by the university. Students were offered the opportunity to apply to Miami as transfer students but only a few remained in Oxford. Many people referred to Western's closing as a merger, but the Western College Program Interdisciplinary Studies degree that emerged in the fall of 1974 was a new program initiated by Miami. The Western that began in 1853 ended in June of 1974. However, the story continued. Without a college and over 6,000 living graduates, Westerners were determined to stay connected. Fortunately, Miami administrators shared and encouraged the vision of the Western College Alumni Association's founding board. With Miami's financial and moral support, which began on June 26, 1974 and continues today, the Western College Alumni Association has existed without a parent institution for nearly 50 years. And we believe this makes the WCAA very unique. We know of it, no other alumni association that has continued without their parent institution for such a lengthy period of time. 
The mission of the association is to keep Westerners connected and support education and human values that carry forward the legacy of the Western College. Western's graduates have remained engaged through reunions, regional gatherings, and an alumni magazine. The success of the association stems from the loyalty and appreciation of Western alumni for their alma mater. Their experiences at Western were unique, but their sense of community is a bond that is shared across the decades. Nearly 3,500 Miami students have benefited from $14 million in scholarships and academic support from Western donors. These scholarship recipients are a very important part of Western's legacy. In addition, Western donors have established endowments totaling $17 million for scholarships, academic enhancements like the Western College Professorship, the Western College Legacy Seminars, and the Western Center for Social Impact and Innovation, as well as various campus preservation funds that will continue to honor Western's legacy in perpetuity. During the WCAA's $4 million campaign for endowment in the, 90, in the 1990s, an operational endowment or also called the end of days fund was established. Faced with an inevitable declining constitu constituency base due to attrition, natural attrition, the Western College Alumni Association Board of Trustees began evaluating the organi organization's future with a strategic planning session in the year 2000. By 2010, a date of dissolution was set for June 30th, 2024, which is the 50th anniversary of the last graduating class. Western alumni will continue to stay connected as an affinity group supported by the Miami Alumni Office. A few years ago, the curatorial committee began focusing on Western's art, antiques, and artifacts housed in Patterson Place. Local historian and volunteer extraordinaire, Dr. Elizabeth Johnson researched the provenance and created accession sheets for each item in the collection. And I'm not kidding, down to the teaspoons. The accession sheets were transcribed into a spreadsheet, which was a hundred page report. And then the committee began working to separate the items they felt were pertinent to Western's history. Appropriate locations for transfer were identified for such items, um, including a desk belonging to Western trustee, Gabriel Tishner, who was a former slave owner and neighbor to Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe um, wrote, drafted a large portion of Uncle Tom's cabin at the desk as she quizzed Mr. T Tishner about his experiences with slavery. The Western Board decided to donate the desk to the McGuffey Museum and it's there for everyone to see now. A painting of Western's first female trustee, Olivia Miley Bryce and her two daughters was donated to the Allen County Museum in Lima, Ohio. This was one of the WCA's most prized possessions. The museum created a new exhibit space to house their John Singer Sargent painting of Eliz Olivia's husband, the former Senator Calvin Bryce who was an 1859 graduate of Miami. The family was finally reunited. And then items non-essential to Western's history were made available to all alumni via an online auction in the fall of 2023. Preserving the, less, the legacy of Western College has been a priority for the WCAA since day one. The Western College Legacy Circle constructed of granite on the Western campus in 2013 provides an outdoor study space and includes Western's history carved on the benches. The original Western buildings, a new residence hall renamed for President Harriet Black Young, 
the iconic features of the campus, including the stone bridges, the pond and the trails, and many memorial plaques around the campus will continue to tell Western's story. There are also many reminders of Western in the Oxford community. A housing development, which was once part of Western College, bears the name of Western Streets, named for Western uh, former faculty and administrators. There's also a Western section in the Oxford Cemetery where many faculty and administrators, including Helen Peabody, are buried. The Miami Western murals that were once mounted in the old movie theater uptown are now beautifully displayed in the Oxford Lane Library. The Western Memorial Archives holds a vast collection of yearbooks, catalogs, scrapbooks, photos, and other materials. The collection of primary source documents serves as a vital resource for researchers. Western endowments created to support the archives staff and special projects such as the digital collections will continue to enhance access to Western's history. In addition, hundreds of items and printed materials are in the process of being transferred from Patterson Place to the archives, which brings us to the preservation process and our friend Eric Harrelson. Great, thank you, Debbie. Um, I really enjoyed hearing that bit of history behind Western Women's College and a lot of the information we got about what we have and what we do have on permanent display. However, what I would like to talk about now is the items that we are unable to have on permanent display anywhere on campus or anywhere else. Uh, we do want to continue to preserve the collections that we've been able to take on. We wanna be able to provide that access to those uh, those primary documents. So let's start by talking about where the, where the uh, materials will be displayed. So uh, all of the items that, that we are going to take over from Patterson Place are gonna come over to the Walter Havinghurst Special Collection and Archive. The uh, Special Collection and Archive holds over 95,000 volumes, including rare books, manuscripts, and special subject collections. Uh, in addition to the archives at Miami, which house not just the university archives for uh, Miami University itself, but also the Western College uh, Memorial Archives and the Oxford College Memorial Archives that document uh, a lot of the history of the Women's College. Uh, we want to make sure that we that you know that your items are in good hands. This is where I come in. It is my job to ensure that all of the documents and items that we take on are properly protected and properly stored so that they can be used and they can remain accessible for generations to come. Uh, a lot of what we are taking over uh, here to the special collections is not just in the form of documents, not just in the form of uh, photographs and things of that effect. We're also taking on a lot of really interesting objects. As you can see in this uh, picture, we have uh, I believe that's a bust of Edward Stillman Kelly on one side over there. We've got some of the uh, massive oil paintings that were hanging in Patterson Place. And I thought these were very interesting as well. The uh, sterling silver napkin holders that were, I believe, a requirement of uh, attendees to Western Women's College. They needed to provide their old napkin holder. So we have a, a collection of those as well. It extends... What I like about collections like this is they extend from just documentation and sort of the nuts and bolts of uh, the history to these interesting little everyday mundane objects. And I think the preservation of those mundane objects gives us such a window into what the life of a Western Women's College student was really like on a day-to-day -day basis. So when considering preservation and conservation, we have to consider three major factors in uh, preservation storage. That's temperature, relative humidity, and UV light exposure. Uh, all of these factor, in the, factor into the degradation of materials, especially paper materials. As you can see in the image over to the right, you can see uh, paper objects that have degraded and become incredibly brittle. Uh, they will break apart, become nearly unusable. 
the best way that we can prevent these things from happening is to ensure that these documents are housed in an environment that controls the, the mitigates temperature, uh, keeps a stable relative humidity, and uh, mitigates exposure to, to uh, UV light. One of the best ways that we can do that, in addition to just the building in and of itself, uh, controlling the temperature, controlling the relative humidity, those things, one of the most important things that we can do with each item on an item level is to create an enclosure custom for that item to protect it from its, to further protect it from its environment. Uh, these enclosures keep dust and grime off of the items. It protects them from the UV light exposure. And it also, an enclosure also protects, uh, offers an additional layer of insulation, if you will, from the uh, environmental challenges of temperature and relative humidity. Uh, and when the air conditioning happens to have a small blip, we can weather those peaks and valleys much more easily if each item is protected. So I'd like to uh, break down some of the procedures that I've done, uh, include some of the items and show you some pictures of how we have been proceeding with ensuring that these collections, uh, that these items in the collections are uh, made safe for both transport and for long-term storage. Uh, one of the first items that we our first collection of items that we are dealing with are the large portraits that were the large oil paintings that were up in Patterson Place. Um, these are, as in with anything oversized, they create some challenges with protection, with enclosure creation, and with storage. So, in order to uh, in order to uh, help with that, the size of these uh, paintings is you know some of them are over four feet tall, as you can see in that picture to the right. You can see some of the archival boxes that were created. Those are leaning up against the mantle that is in Patterson Place. If you can kind of picture the size of that and then sort of understand the size of the uh, box along with it. Uh, those enclosures were so large that uh, I was unable to produce them in uh, myself in the preservation lab. So I needed to contract out with a custom uh, uh, professional bindery and conservation company in New Manchester, Indiana called HF Group. Uh, we reached out to HF Group and sent them specs. They sent us back the uh, sent us back the boxes. The boxes are all constructed out of archival materials. That means they are acid free. They don't off gas. Um, with uh, uh, with enclosure creation, one can't just use sort of normal cardboard. Normal cardboard is acidic, and uh, acid, as as we all well know, damages. Uh, whatever it comes in contact with, but in particular, anything, uh, any paper goods or anything like paintings and whatnot do suffer some pretty extensive damage from acid. Uh, if you recall that uh, slide I showed with the brittle breaking of paper, a lot of that is accelerated by the acidic content of that paper. So we need to ensure that all of our materials are archival safe, meaning acid free, meaning uh, neutral and meaning they don't have any off-gassing, uh, which is the release of a chemical upon uh, curing, such like a glue may do. So with these, uh, I constructed custom foam inserts to protect the painting in the box so that when it is transported, it is uh, safe and snug in its housing. Uh, and I also um, attached the lids to these boxes with um, packing straps to ensure that they stayed closed during the move and then in turn uh, for their long-term storage. These enclosures will be finished with uh, images of the paintings that are on them uh, pasted to the front so that we um, can know what we have and what we're looking at without having to uh, take them out of their, of their archival enclosure. In addition to the paintings, we also have uh, numerous different uh, objects that we have to create custom enclosures for. As I uh, mentioned before, we have those napkin holders. We have varying different pieces of uh, Western uh, legacy items. There are, uh, as Debbie mentioned, there are teaspoons. We have tea sets. We have ceramic jugs, plates. There is the ceremonial mace. We have many, many, many different objects to take care of. Each one of these objects needs to have its own custom enclosure created. And we use the same cardboard that we spoke of, archival safe cardboard. Uh, the procedure that I usually take is I will uh, clean the object, 
uh, to remove any dust and debris, anything that may uh, over long term uh, cause damage to the object. And then I begin the construction of a custom box for it. Here are some uh, just examples of the item after cleaning. Uh, on your uh, on the next slide, you'll see, or on the next uh, image, you'll see the box, which is lined with a special archival foam to ensure that this item is protected. Being uh, ceramic like that, we certainly wouldn't want it to break if it happens to be nudged in the archive. So we protect that with an additional layer of foam. And I also pack uh, the item in with um, acid-free buffered uh, tissue. Buffered tissue is uh, buffered with, usually like with a talcum powder, it, it uh, uh, raises the basic, uh, as, in, as in terms of an acid and a base, it makes the paper actually actively basic. So that acid we spoke of will not only be sort of protected against, but the paper will actually be able to absorb some of that and further assist in uh, lengthening the life of the object. Uh, now here you can see a different type of uh, a different type of, of enclosure that I've made. This uh, enclosure was made for uh, Helen Peabody's Bible. So this is what is known as a clamshell enclosure. It is constructed from book board. These are boards that I would use for the cover of like a hardback book. Uh, the construction it consists of two trays that are made separately, and as you can see on the uh, second slide. Uh, these are then covered with book cloth. And then each tray, they nestle in, in one another. And each the uh, both trays are then attached to a case with a spine on it. As you can see, I've lined this one in the archival foam as well to help protect Helen's Bible. This is an image of uh, Helen Peabody's Bible snug in its little box. And then we cover it up and it is protected with book cloth. It is protected with the foam and it is protected with the very rigid uh, bookboard uh, cardboard. So what this does is this creates a nice, snug, uh, durable construction for an object like uh, Helen Peabody's Bible. As you can see, the wear and tear around it, that wear is only increased with use. And if it is on a shelf by itself, it will... You know, the, if it's used, if it's accessed, that degradation will only grow. We enclose them to prevent a lot of that usage uh, degradation as well. The collection also uh, houses many different uh, documents and photographs, uh, in addition to just in addition to objects and uh, the paintings. Uh, as you can see in this photo, we have a couple of examples of some of the photograph collections. The uh, image on the bottom is a panoramic class photo, which I believe is about 36 inches long. Um, these items, uh, photographs in particular, uh, due to age, the emulsification uh, in conjunction with the paper backing will sometimes cause curling. As you can see on the image to the right, I have uh, numerous different individual photographs from uh, Western College, and you can see that they are kind of bowed from uh, from that uh, curing of the emulsification and the uh, the shrinkage of the paper and whatnot. Uh, they are on a rack right now because what they are uh, what they are about to undergo is a process called humidification, which is the gentle introduction of moisture and water vapor into a paper product in order to relax the fibers and it allows us to alleviate some of that warping on a paper document. It may have wrinkles, it may have folds. Uh, that process will allow us to then flatten that document and create a nice preserved flat documentation, a piece of documentation rather, that is then in turn ready for the next step of uh, enclosure creation. For uh, document and uh, photo creation, I don't make a box for a photo necessarily. What I will do is I will uh, encapsulate the object in mylar through a process called ultrasonic welding. Ultrasonic welding is a fairly basic uh, principle. There are two, I, I use two sheets of mylar and through the uh, ultrasonic welding machine, the uh, vibration through the horn uh, heats up the molecules in the mylar just enough to create a bond. 
This bond requires no heat from the actual uh, machine, and it doesn't allow any of that heat transfer to the document itself. So there's no risk of uh, damaging a document by encapsulating it in this, uh, in this uh, uh, form. It also is a much safer and much, uh, uh, much more uh, easily accessible form of enclosure creation for uh, singular documents or photographs because we wanna be able to access that image. We wanna be able to see that photograph without having to uh, open it up and handle the photograph in and of itself. So as you can see here, we have a uh, panorama of the Western College dating from 1909. And uh, this is another large uh, panorama that is about um, probably 40 inches or so long. And as you can see along the edges, you can see where the uh, ultrasonic welder has stitched those pieces of mylar together. Another really important factor to consider uh, when talking about encapsulation, when talking about uh, using mylar and ultrasonic welding is that the process is completely reversible. Any process we use, anything we use, any uh, treatment that we do to a document or to an object, we wanna try to ensure that that treatment is reversible so that we are not altering the item in and of itself, we are trying to enhance it, trying to uh, you know preserve it. We don't want to change the item. This is why we don't use uh, sort of conventional lamination because conventional lamination is permanent. Once that item is between those two uh, those two sheets of plastic, there is a very strong adhesive and a heat binding uh, a heat binding component, and that document is in there permanently. When using mylar and uh, ultrasonic welding, that document is is, eas is easily removed from that in for the, from that enclosure should it need to be. In addition to the physical objects, uh, the numerous different documents, the different books, uh, the photographs, all of the interesting objects that present their own uh, suite of fun and interesting problems to solve, we also have the uh, we have audiovisual collections and we have our digital collections. So one of the biggest goals of a digital collection is to provide access to materials that are um, that are older, more delicate, more fragile, and creating a copy of that material that can be used in research, can be used by uh, anyone who wants to uh, engage with that item, if we can avoid using the physical item, then we have done a significant, uh, a significant uh, good for that piece of, for that item, for that piece of documentation, because it will, it won't have to suffer the damage of handling. And no matter how careful we are, repeated handling will damage our objects over time. Uh, another uh, another purpose of digital collections is to provide access to materials in, uh, as, particularly audiovisual materials in inaccessible formats. Um, as we uh, progress and as the formats, as technology progresses and as the formats fall out of favor, it is very difficult to find a piece of machinery that can actually play one of these <laughs> older reel-to-reel tape recordings. Even finding a, a, a piece of equipment that can play a simple cassette tape can be very challenging in today's day and age. In order to alleviate that problem, we can hold on to the original material, we can hold on to the original format, we can keep the original object, but we can provide a digital access to that information, thereby alleviating the need to search out and seek out the equipment that it was required to play. So uh, as you can see here, we have numerous different collections from the uh, Western Women's College uh, available through our website and our digital collections. Uh, these are just a couple of screenshots of some of the examples. We have the uh, Freedom Summer Audiovisual Collection. We have the Western College Oral Histories. 
Uh, we also have the Western Roundup student newspaper. And uh, recently, I believe in the past month or so, uh, our uh, digital collections librarian, Aliyah Wegner, has uploaded a new Western College periodical uh, digital collection as well. You can access that from anywhere with an internet connection. All you need to do is go to the Miami, uh, Miami University Libraries page, click on research and support, and from down that from that pull down menu, you can find our digital collections. So thank you very much. I think that wraps up about all I have insofar as the collection, insofar as the digital, the object, the digital, the preservation collection that we have talked about. I hope you all are uh, safe and secure in knowing that I, uh, that we over at Special Collections and myself personally in preservation are taking good care of your objects and ensuring that we have access to those uh, throughout the next 20, 30, 50 years. And we are hoping that we can provide access to those and preserve the legacy of Western Women's College. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Debbie, for talking about the history and the impact of Western College for Women, and Eric talking about why it's worth preserving these legacies. Uh, so again, if you have questions, drop them in to ask the question. Again, thank you to those who submitted questions beforehand, so we have some time to get into some of these questions. Uh, so I'll go ahead and ask one of the earlier ones. Uh, Debbie, how has the influence of the Western College shown up internationally for those global alumni that returned home? Well, I think the best way to answer this question is to share some statements from international students themselves. So Hildegard John, who actually came to the Western campus um, a few years ago, stayed here at Patterson Place. She was class of 1953 from Germany. And in a questionnaire that she completed, she stated that the year in Western was the most important event in her life. Her 20 years of American German high school exchange showed how much Western affected her professional life. And then from Elizabeth Torgerson, whose class of 1961 from Norway, she said that the year had considerable impact on her life. Being together with so many foreign students who were friends from various parts of the world was an eye opener <coughs> to the fact that political issues have more than one truth. Her tolerance base was based very much on her experience at Western. So I think these are two really good examples of how Western impacted um, the, in, the lives of international students. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Eric, we've got one in the, the chat, and it has to do with uh, this cleaning involved removing tarnish from the sterling silver objects. That is a very interesting question because there are uh, sort of competing ideas in preservation and conservation about the uh, nature of cleaning and the uh, extent to which one will clean uh, different items. So, uh, there was a paper written called Washing the Archive. And in this paper, the question was posed very much what I just kind of laid out. What does, how does it change the item to clean it? This was uh, in context of a papal bowl, which is a, a, a pretty standard issuance of uh, selling indulgences or something to that effect. But this papal bowl uh, was, had originated in Spain had found its way to um, an indigenous population in what is uh, now Northern Chile. Uh, that piece of paper, that document, then made its way into the tomb of a, um, of a luminary in that community, which was then unearthed and sent to New York uh, to be in the, uh, in the Smithsonian, I think. The question was, the object was dirty, it had you know, numerous different bits of candle soot, all sorts of handling dirt and tarnish on it from the actual use of the object. And the question was, should this object be cleaned and have all of that sort of interesting legacy of it removed? 
or should it be left on to sort of tell the story of that object more? Uh, so that's kind of the balance that we strike. We have to figure out whether or not uh, removing the tarnish from the silver item would make it sort of less itself. We save the items for their age, for their association in particular with what it means to have had those objects at that time at Western, not whether or not it is a nice clean piece of silver. Short answer is I haven't decided yet. <laughs> Thank you. Debbie, you discussed the, the closure of Western College. If you wanna add any more on that, because this question really leads, is real about what's happening with the Alumni Association and the, will they have a, a place in the future? Sure. Um, first of all, something that I didn't mention in the presentation about the closing of the college is the fact that during this time, um, this was a it wasn't a problem unique to Western. The number of women's colleges peaked to at 281 in the 60s, and today there are only 26. So a lot of women's colleges during that era um, closed or um, became co-educational or merged with other institutions. Um, in terms of the Western College Alumni Association, um, the, as I mentioned, the group will become an affinity group um, housed by, or serviced by, provided support by the Miami Alumni Association. They will have a web page. They will have um, access to contact information um, that they need. And then they will also have, uh, right now, we, they have an alumni magazine. That's going to be moved to a digital format. So they will be able to view and um, submit class notes online. Uh, West, the association also has a Facebook group and that will continue once the association office closes. So things will be a little different, but there will be multiple vehicles for Westerners to stay connected and also receive the same services provided by Miami University to their own alums. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, during your presentation, you mentioned these cannonball used to stones and this kind of stuff. So this question, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it at Eric though, but it, uh, it, it's an interesting question. So I'm obviously interested. How long was the, the Miami military cannon in Western Pond? And of course, what's the story behind that? So I think uh, what this is referencing, what this question is referencing is a, a, an account that uh, Steve Gordon gave uh, in a webinar uh, not too awful long ago. <laughs> so uh, in uh, 1869, uh, President Stratton uh, proposed a new Department of Military Science. I believe that's President Stratton from, uh, from uh, Miami. Uh, so in September of 1869, uh, a Colonel Caleb Carlton arrived at Miami, who is a West Point graduate, a veteran of Missionary Ridge and Sherman's March. <coughs> so he was to be the instructor of this military science program. So for a few months, the students studied military law and engineering, and uh, they had a cannon with them that they'd drag across the yard, the college yard. Um, but by April of 1870, the program had just kind of fallen apart. It just kind of dissolved. But at some point in a uh, what, what was referred to as a restless night in April, the artillery squad, artillery squad, pardon me, dragged the cannon to Western College and uh, fired a blank charge at Peabody Hall uh, as a prank, I assume. Uh, the next day, some uh, Western students, as revenge for that prank, pushed the cannon into the pond. Uh, the cannon didn't stay very long in the pond. Evidently, uh, Charles McGuffey Hepburn has a uh, entry of this in his journal. Um, in, on April 23rd of 1870, he acknowledges that the cannon was pulled out relatively quickly after it had already gone in, but he recounts the, the Ida, recounts the night and lays out that it was just all kind of a fun college prank. Firing a cannon off being a fun college prank is interesting, but I mean, hey, I guess it was the 1870s. <laughs> Great. Okay, so here's a question. I'm going to ask this just because I'm 
curious that there may be some more significance to it. Debbie, but it, uh, one of her asked, where is Gr Helen Peabody's green stool? Is there a story behind that or significance? Yes, the stool is still in Patterson Place, but Eric will, of course, be building a special box to contain it when it goes to the archives. But um, Helen was known as a nurturing uh, principal. So in her office, she had a green stool. And when students came in to chat with her, she would ha actually have them kneel on the green stool. And there are photographs in the archives um, picturing this. So we still have the stool and it will be going to the archives. Great, thank you. And we talked about the architecture. So uh, <clears throat> Eric, were there any sister schools built by the same architect? Uh, so uh, I've seen, that, uh, this is one of the questions that came in earlier for us. Yes. Um, However, I don't have any, uh, this was a, in particular uh, in relation to uh, Agnes Scott College in Decatur. And uh, I don't, I couldn't dig up any information on what, on, on uh, any of the designers for that particular place. But what I can tell you is the Western architects were all local to the area, <clears throat> um, Hamilton, Cincinnati, Dayton. And I, I think the furthest was Columbus, uh, Ohio. Uh, but as far as two of the oldest buildings go, uh, Peabody Hall, was um, constructed by the firm of Walter and Wilson, uh, Cincinnati's James Wilson, who's a Gothic revivalist. He also built or designed the old main at the uh, Bethany College campus in Bethany, West Virginia. Uh, and Alumni Hall was designed by uh, Joseph W. Yost from Columbus, who had designed previously uh, courthouses, chapels in, uh, in a uh, many different locations in Ohio. Uh, he also designed the Edwards Gymnasium and Pfeiffer Natatorium in 1905-1906 that's at Ohio Wesleyan. So I can't say as far as uh, Agnes Scott College, but we do have some of those designs in places, you know, Ohio Wesleyan and in uh, in West Virginia. So <clears throat> it's possible. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, and again, um, they're good questions. I'm going to ask them just because what we go to, but uh, they uh, one person wants to know what's going to happen to the senior th thesis is from Western grad. Where will they be stored? Uh, I think I've got an answer for that, but go ahead. Hopefully your answer matches mine, Bill. As far as I know, they are stored in the archives. Is that correct? Yes. And there's another one about senior projects. Um, uh, you know, I'm pretty certain that we're, we're, if we can get them, we're getting them over here. So we're gonna we're doing all we can. Speaking of that, Eric, how many objects do you think we've that you've worked with coming over from you and Debbie work with coming over? From I mean, here? you know, I've only I've I've already handled probably. I mean, I've had had at least a hundred come through, and there's you know just more on the way. We are we are uh, you know really trying to take as much as we possibly can. Anything that we can we can. Uh, we can get anything that we find significant. Uh, I'm a fan of the of anything that's sort of odd and interesting. We, you know, we have a uh, uh, Edgar Stillman Kelly's Inkwell. We have uh, you know a lot of just those little interesting interesting things. Those little objects that just paint a more complete picture of what life would have been like in Western or the things that, that I'm always most excited about. So we're preserving as many of those as we possibly can, but hundreds. And as far as documentation goes, thousands. Excellent. <clears throat> there, there have been uh, a lot of big thank yous and uh, all that in the chat. So I, I want to echo those as we come to a close. A lot, the, some other questions, uh, you know, of course, about the future of Patterson Place and things like that, that, uh, weren't really our purview, but like I said, we'll see. But there, uh, the other thing is people obviously are coming in that they have materials that they may want to donate, so they need to reach out to us and this kind of stuff. So, uh, but again, we uh, JJ, who's been hosting this for us, is going to cover and pass on your contact information so they can get these questions out. Uh, some great alumni coming in, you know, thanking you for an excellent presentation. I do want to share that as with my own thank yous and all this stuff. And so with that, we will uh, sign off and give everybody uh, thank you again for attending. Thank you both for presenting and give them back to their days. <laughs>